called gross profit. It might be called gross, gross margin. But either way, whatever it's called, we're talking about above the line, profit and loss section, divide, make an imaginary line in your profit and loss statement between sales minus cost of sales or cost of goods sold, and then everything else below the margin, below the line. So now that we're clear about dividing our conversational focus today on above the line and below the line, let's move forward. So I don't think my screen advanced. There we go. All right, here is an example of a construction company profit and loss statement. This is the only slide that I've given you on paper that is worth your attention. Make notes on it, refer to it. This slide is the basis for all of the other conversations about profit and loss. So I've highlighted the, the above the line. I've driven, I've, I've uh, put a dashed red line just to say it one more time very clearly what we're talking about. Sales minus cost of goods sold is gross profit. You can always take your operational results and turn them into percentages, and that's um, tip number two. Um, that will make it easier for you to keep your eye on the price. If you convert everything into percentages, you can track the fluctuations between percentages a lot easier than you can wrap your brain around millions of dollars and a few cents. So in this example, Cactus Jack, his margin is 25%. That is a good margin, okay? If you have anything better than that, you're doing way better than the average person. And if you at least have that, you usually have enough left over to cover everything else, like rent, insurance, W2 payroll, interest expense, depreciation, everything else that comes out of your profit and loss income to the point where it gets to the bottom line net. So um, we've talked about this very basically. Which one is best? It depends. Are you looking at your P&L from an operational standpoint? Are you trying to understand operations as they translate to dollars and cents? Or are you trying to understand if you have a cash flow problem? Do you have a cash flow problem in terms that the timing of your cash flows aren't frequent enough to pay for what you need to pay when you have, when you have to pay? Are you always out of money? <laughs> so if you're asking that question, we would be talking about cash basis profit and loss. And some businesses report their earnings on a cash basis for tax purposes and some on a accrual basis. That's not a topic for today either. We're talking about operational decisions and how they affect your ability as owners or business owners, people within a small business, um, giving you actionable intelligence, arming you with the ability to make more profitable decisions in your role as what you are within a business. So. For today's class, um, accrual basis is definitely what we're talking about only. Um, we're also talking about closed periods only, and here's where we talk about closed periods. To be honest, if you were honest, who knows what a closed period really means? I mean, in, in, in the workable day of your ins and outs of what you do on a daily basis, does anybody really get what a closed period is? I mean, I understand it to be like, let's just use like the, you know, end of the year as an example. Mm -hmm. It's closed. It's done. Mm -hmm. No more receipts. No more, <coughs> no more. Once you've closed, it's just, you know, from that day on. But is that really, I mean, my question, because I've written this down, is, okay, so at the end of the, you know, in a perfect world, I'm going to close my books at the end of December. But who's to say yet if our jobs aren't completed 
our crews are still hanging on to receipts, you know, so is there like a leeway period? Can I not close December until the end of January to make sure I have all those, you know, receipts and invoices and everything? Yes, exactly. Um, I have the perfect slide for that question. It's not here yet, but we're coming to it. But the answer to that is yes. Dates do matter. And when we are talking about closed periods during the year, we're talking about the matching principle. Somebody may have mentioned this to you in a county class somewhere at some point, if you might remember. It's, it's a generally accepted accounting principle, principle called the matching principle, and we use the matching principle to determine the timing of what hits your profit and loss statement in what month. So for example, if you have an invoice from your vendor, you enter it into your books, usually based on the date of the, of the bill. If you are doing an invoice, you normally post your invoice after you've done the job and it's a billable income to you at that point. It goes into your profit and loss statement based on the date of your invoice. So date of your invoice, date of your bill, those all determine what month your activity is going to end up on your profit and loss statement. Now, the matching principle is, is a good principle. It's, it's the best principle that I can say that can, ever came out of generally accepted accounting principles because it's pretty simple when it comes to matching up. When did I perform the service and what costs were incurred in the process of performing the services. If you have jobs that turn over every single month and they don't cross over into a different period, it all ends up perfectly matched, right? You, you did a job for $100, it cost you $50, you entered the bill and you invoiced in the same month. Doesn't matter when you paid it, that's cash basis. But for performance, you entered the invoice when you were, when the, when the job became billable, you performed the service, meaning the outflows have already been, uh, outflows have already hit your checking account. And so in the perfect world, these two things line up and then your profit and loss tells you truly your profit and loss for the month. But that's only when things match up. As Vicki mentioned, sometimes the outflows of a job, they cross periods and you don't ever get paid until another month. If that's the case and you're booking all of these costs to the P&L when they are incurred and when you pay them, and the income for those hits in a different period, if you're looking at your profit and loss, it's telling you something that doesn't make sense, right? It, if that was your only income, then let's say January, you had a loss because there's no income, you want only expense. February, no income, only expense, loss. March, we get the money, and now the money comes in, and actually the money that paid for it, the money that was used to earn it, was over three more months. So, when we have that issue, it still needs to be matched up to, to be meaningful to you. If it doesn't match up and it's not a true reflection of profit and loss on that job, it gives you misinformation. This is where your friend work in process comes in, into play. How, how many people know work in process? I know one person <laughs> does work in process. Okay. All right, let me see if I can find that particular slide. I think it's here. All right. Work in process is also called WIP. Manufacturing companies largely use WIP because of this same issue. They make a product in one month, but it's not sold until another period, not the same period. So, in QuickBooks, you can use your basic QuickBooks subscription to create new cost of goods 
accounts in your inventory section because this will actually go to your balance sheet. And when, the, when you are booking things to the balance sheet, it's called work in progress and the sum total of your work in progress doesn't move over to your profit and loss statement until you invoice the job. You can pay for inventory software, it's quite expensive. To me, I would just set up three accounts on your balance sheet and also use project related information. You can create projects and jobs in QuickBooks and in all of your other softwares. And when you pay something, pay it in association with a job. Pay it in, associ in association with a particular um, project. Tag those outflows to the product or the person, the client, the job. Tag it all together so that you can keep track of what is going into your work in progress because guess what? You might have more than one project going on at the same time, right? So, use so your you balance put, sheet. So you would put work in progress and then the name of the project? And behind the scenes, at a lower level, when you're entering your bill, the bill will also say, is this outflow for a particular customer job or project? Then you set up your customer job or project and you tag it when you enter it. You tag it when you pay it. Is there a tagline? You can even use tags. Yes, exactly. You can do it that way too. Um, whatever way.